questions that we're working through this Easter weekend is, did Jesus die on the cross and did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because if he didn't, then Christianity is a hoax. But if he did, if he did, we should be all in with our Christian faith. There should be nothing that holds us back from that. So as we look at the evidence for, for both of those cases, may the Lord transform our hearts to say, if this is real, then maybe we should live a little bit differently than we've chosen. We should be pursuing resurrected lives in Jesus. On Friday, the Good Friday service we had at noon here, I talked about the evidence for Jesus and his death on the cross. Because before you can have resurrection, you first have to have death. And so we looked at the evidence from an archaeological and and historical medical point of view, and and we saw that Jesus did die on the cross that day. He was dead. And considering he died today, we'd like to discover, did Jesus really then rise from the dead? And this is a big deal. The resurrection is the ultimate uh, representation of Jesus' claim to be God. And that's the marker. Uh, Paul, a New Testament follower of Jesus, he writes to the church in Corinth, the resurrection is the very linchpin of Christian faith. Here's what he says. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. A theologian has remarked, in a profound sense, Christianity without the resurrection is not simply Christianity without its final chapter, It's not Christianity. The resurrection is a big deal. It is the supreme vindication of Jesus' divine identity and his inspired teaching. It's his proof of triumph over sin and death. It's the foreshadowing of the resurrection of his followers. It's the basis of Christian hope. It's the miracle of all miracles. So let's look at the evidence for the resurrection this morning. So if you have your Bibles, hey, I hope you've got God's word with you. Now, the reason we say that is, man, we want you to have access to the Bible. And so if you don't have a Bible with you today, there's one underneath the seat in front of you or underneath the seat that you're sitting in. You're welcome to borrow that Bible today. If you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to take that one home as a gift from the church. We want you to have access to God's word. And I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of God's word today. Simply to say that these words are important, so we just show reverence to say thank you, God, for giving us your word. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 27 today, so Matthew instead of Luke, Matthew chapter 27. We're going to start in verse 57 and work our way into the end of the chapter. So Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 57, Matthew writes, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he'd cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. And the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. These are the very words of God. You may be seated this morning. I had mentioned on Friday that Lee Strobel, he does a wonderful job talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus in his book, The Case for Christ. And if you haven't read it, first of all, I'd like to recommend that. We have kind of a a condensed version, the case for Easter. You may have saw those as you walked in this morning. Feel free to take a copy with you as you head out the door for yourself. If you want copies for friends or family members that might benefit from looking at the evidences for the death and resurrection of Jesus, feel free to take them with you. We mean to resource you. 
And I encourage you, read through it. it it's, it's very helpful. I'm going to dive into some of those truths today, uh, but that would give you more understanding. So what I want to do this morning is share a few of Strobel's thoughts, along with others, all the while looking at scripture of what happened on this day 2,000 years ago. And the first thing we need to establish is whether or not Jesus was really buried in a tomb. Okay, so we talked on Friday, Jesus died. But before he can have resurrection, he's got to resurrect from somewhere. So did he go to a tomb? And we just read in a book called Matthew that a man named Joseph took the body of Jesus and he placed it in his own new tomb. What we also find in a book called 1 Corinthians that a man named Paul, he writes believers in the city of Corinth and here's what he tells them. For I delivered to you, writing the Corinthian believers, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. We talked about that Friday in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, so now he's testifying to the burial of Jesus. And that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. So these verses, along with a few others that follow, they're understood to be a creed of the early church, written within a few years of the resurrection of Jesus. And you can't start to create legend until the people who were there to see it no longer live. So this is witness to the death and burial of Jesus. So then the question is, well, how secure was that tomb? So the picture you see is of a first century tomb in Jerusalem. If you go with us on the trip to Israel, you'll go visit this tomb. It's one of the only of its kind, where you can see the type of tomb that Jesus was buried in. So you can see the round stone, and it was on this elevated plain. And if you were to go up close to that, to that tomb, which the nice thing over there is you can climb on everything. Like OSHA, no rules. No rules, which can also be a very dangerous thing. My, my father-in-law had come to visit one summer and we went to go uh, walk along the, the old city walls. And so we start going up to the old city and we're going up these walls and it's, I don't know, like 50 feet in. He stops, he's like, this is a nightmare. He's like, I've got a guy that works for OSHA in my church. Like this would be banned. Like this is not safe. I'm like, I know, isn't it great? <laughs> But the tomb that you find, first century tomb, if you were to go look at it, there was this track that the, the rock was rolled on and it would be rolled downward. Could it be opened? Yes, but it would take a couple of really strong guys, a few guys to get that stone back open. The tomb that Jesus was laid down into, it was secure. But what about the resurrection? Reading from Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. And he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he was risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. Isn't that an interesting mix? Follow Jesus. It's fearful and it's joyful. Oh, it's interesting to follow Jesus. And ran to tell his disciples. So here's what we have in terms of some of the, of course, we could look at some of the other written accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. But I'd like to go back to the creed that Paul shares with the Corinthian church. So I'm going to read the verses that follow too. So Paul again writes, For I delivered to you, to these Corinthian believers, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. It's understood that Paul learned this creed directly from Peter and James within a few years after Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Paul is transmitting eyewitness testimony you know, of, of James and other apostles and, and the men that saw him in that, in that large crowd. And of course, he shares his own, for Paul saw the resurrected Jesus too. 
In this testimony, it's being shared with other people. The early Christians, they all know it. This is part of what changed their lives, seeing the resurrected Christ. The creed, as I mentioned, it's no legend because people still had opportunity to verify this account. That's why Paul says, of the large group that saw Jesus, most are still alive, some have passed. What he's saying to the Corinthian believers is, if you're having a hard time believing the resurrection, go talk to these people and verify this account for yourself. People could still determine whether it was true that Jesus was seen after he had been buried. But now how can we know if the creed is valid. How can we know that this was written within a, a few years of the resurrection of Jesus? A well-known German historian, here's what he shared in studying this creed. This account meets all the demands of historical reliability that could possibly be made of such a text. But what about besides scripture? Besides these early writings documenting the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, how else can we know whether or not Jesus was resurrected from the dead? I think it's important for us to know The resurrection was undoubtedly the central proclamation of the early church from the very beginning. The earliest Christians, they didn't just endorse Jesus' teachings, they were convinced they saw him alive after his crucifixion. That's what changed their lives. That's really what started the church. Uh, Think about it. When Jesus was crucified, what did his followers do? They were discouraged, they were depressed. They no longer had confidence that Jesus had been sent by God because they believed anyone who was crucified was accursed by God. So they began to have doubts. They also had been taught that God would not let his Messiah suffer death. So what did his followers do after his death? They dispersed. They thought everything was done. The Jesus movement was all but stopped in its tracks. But then, after a short time, we see them abandoning their occupation. So the followers of Jesus, what happened? They had dispersed, they were depressed, they were disappointed, they were discouraged. But then something happened because they gave up their occupations, they were regathering, they were committing themselves to spreading the message that Jesus was the Messiah who died on the cross, he returned to life and was seen alive by them. That's what they began to preach. And they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. And this is what makes Christianity different because there's been other movements, but usually there was some kind of immediate payoff for those that went in and went along with that movement or or religious structure. But not for these disciples. There was no earthly benefit. No benefit for them to share the good news of Jesus with others. These early followers, they faced a life of hardship. They often went without food. They slept exposed to the elements. They were ridiculed, beaten, and imprisoned. And finally, most of them, they were executed for their belief in Jesus. Why would they have done that? How can you move from discouraged, depressed, and dispersing to now devoting our entire life to this message? Something happened, and that something was a resurrection. I mean, even those who were initially skeptics of Jesus, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul, they had, Paul had been persecuting the church. James didn't believe that Jesus was a son of God, but then something happened. They saw Jesus alive and their lives were changed. Think about this for a minute. What would it take for your sibling to believe you were the son of God? <laughs> Come on, siblings. <laughs> you know it. Like James, he he was not a believer, but he became a believer because he saw Jesus alive. James's recognition of his brother as the Lord, it might be the best argument for the deity of Jesus. No sibling's ever gonna believe that. Like whatever, Jesus. And then Jesus dies, he rose again. Okay, Jesus. Like that's how that goes. James became a believer. According to the first century Jewish historian Josephus, James was eventually arrested and executed for his unwavering faith in his big brother. James saw something. He saw the resurrected Lord. Only the resurrection can do that. Because of the resurrection, the early followers of Jesus, they gave everything to proclaim his message all over the world. They gave everything. And so then the question is, well, how should that affect our lives today? 
the disciples, they lived a resurrected life by leveraging their entire life for the sake of proclaiming this message. Maybe the final appeal I'd give pointing to the resurrection of Jesus is his ongoing work today. Jesus didn't just show up for the disciples. His appearance is there. Jesus shows up into the lives of all of those who call him Lord. On most Sundays here, we have in your Connect cards an opportunity for things that we can pray with you about and things to celebrate. Usually we're relaying celebrations of here's how I see God at work in my life. Jesus is at work today because he was resurrected. He's been at work in Shelly and I's life. I've I've shared before the first eight years of our marriage. We could have no kids and, and so we visited doctors and we're trying to figure out solutions and eventually we had our first son, Nate. And then we went overseas and we took medicine with us. Hey, this, this was helpful before, maybe this will be helpful again and, and it wasn't. No kids and so we just said, well, Lord, it's in your hands, we'll commit it to prayer. And shortly thereafter, then our daughter Haley was born. A few years after that, again, no intervention, Lucas was born. All things unto the Lord. What doctor said, impossible. God says, I'm still alive. It's possible. The resurrection power that's been available to to the Lord for him to be resurrected from the dead, it's available to us. He appears to us still. So then the question for us, knowing Jesus has been resurrected from the dead, is why is it some of us still live like he's in the tomb? Why are we not living those resurrected lives that were offered in him? Why do we sometimes choose fear instead of faith? Why do we choose despair over hope? We need to call out to our resurrected savior and live resurrected lives today. I'm gonna ask Shelly to come and share a few thoughts about that. I think the team started that, they're having fun with you. Don't do that. (laughs) Um, so yesterday I was listening to a song and it's been mentioned a couple of times already, but it's a Jeremy Camp song and it says the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. And yesterday that was a song that I just listened to over and over and over again, but that's me. I'm the repeat person. So if you don't like to do that, don't ride with me. (laughs) Um, anyways, you know what I'm saying? There's some of you in the room that are like, no, anyway. That was my song yesterday on repeat. And if you just process the words of that song, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. And that's so powerful in my own life because what I have experienced, and I I love that Zach is willing to do the research and look it all up and have the facts and have all the details and, you know, be able to cite all these awesome researchers. I love that. But no one can argue with what God has done in my life. And you know, you can call me names, you can tell me I'm an idiot, and that's okay because I cannot deny what Jesus has done in my own life. And that's why God does such amazing things because he wants us to know him personally. And it's through that same power that that's even possible And so I've just took some time to reflect that same power healed my body. That same power healed Haley. That same power has forgiven me. That same power has restored me. That same power gave me peace in the middle of a conflict and war. There's just so many things I can list on and on and on that declare this power. And it's supposed to be in us in our lives, it's supposed to mean something. And it gives us this awesome power to stand on, to be able to share with other people. It shouldn't be a burden and there shouldn't be a fear to tell of this awesome power that is available to us. And so today for me, it's just this awesome celebration because there's so many other people who are also celebrating that Jesus is alive. And if he's alive, then guess what that means for me? Miracles in my life, miracles in my family. And it's just, it's an amazing wonder that he asks us to be a part of that, that he shares that with us, that that same power, you're gonna have to listen to it today. And I hope you listen to it two or three times. That same power that rose Jesus from the dead, the same power that calms a raging sea. And to me, it's just a message of hope 
If God can do that for Jesus, then that's hope for me. And I hope that's hope for you as well. Thanks, Shell. So Paul, he shares this creed with the believers in Corinth. And he does that because it, it seems they don't understand the implications of if Jesus was not resurrected. So Paul actually gets into some verses that follow to say, look, if Jesus was not resurrected, here's the implications. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if we, if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Here's the conclusions. So Paul is saying the resurrection matters. And here's people you can go talk to that shows you it is true. Because how does Paul end? But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So think about this this morning. If if we think Jesus is still in the tomb, if that's the way you're living, here's the implications. Our talking about Jesus is in vain. The faith of Christians is in vain. The work of the early apostles is false. We would still be bound by our evil hearts. Those dead have simply perished. And lastly, we who are Christians are to be the most pitied people on earth. If Jesus is still in the tomb, this is the life we have. But what does then Paul say? Verse 20, but in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead. And Paul can say it. Jesus has been raised. He is risen. And what do we say? He is risen indeed. He is risen. And we need to proclaim that. That's why we say that on Easter. Because the resurrection is so important for us. Because that which Paul lays out is not the truth for us. Here's the truth. Because he's been risen, our sins are forgiven. Our faith is well founded. What the early believers of Jesus preached is true. It means we are to be envied. And it means those who have fallen asleep, what does it mean? They're alive today. They're with Jesus. That those who follow Jesus... We will one day live forever in joy. We do not come to an empty end after a full and valuable life. That's not the end of Christians. No, we live forever with the one who lived, died, and rose again. This is the power of the resurrection. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, then let's stop living like he's still in the tomb and start living resurrected lives today. Let's have faith instead of fear. Let's have hope instead of disillusioned lives. Let's have lives full of wonder because that's who Jesus is. Hey, maybe it's fearful, but it's still joyful. Saying, Jesus, we trust you. Lives that are full of peace and not chaos. Lives full of joy, not despair. Lives that operate in the power of the resurrection. Let's live those kind of lives today, all this week. All this month, why not all year? Let's live resurrected lives today. He is risen. How much better could your life be if you lived like Jesus was resurrected? And that's not to say that your life will be easy. But here's the promise, Jesus says. In this life you will have trouble, but I have overcome the world. He overcame it 2,000 years ago in the resurrection. So even though challenges come, we can pray to our resurrected Jesus to say, oh God, I need that power today. And he says, I'm glad to give it. Let's live resurrected lives. How much better could your marriage be if you lived knowing Jesus is alive and active today? He sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for your marriage. 
We need to have that kind of faith in the marriages that we have. How much better could your interactions with family and friends be if you lived full of confidence in your eternal future? To know that this life that I have is but temporary, so I'm going to leverage it for the sake of my eternal hope and future. Why not start living that life today? You're not going to know what it feels like until you step into that life, and we invite you to that today. I invite you to stand as we close in song this morning. And before we sing, I just want to ask you this morning, maybe you're here today, and you have, have recognized as we've been talking through, have you been living like Jesus is still in the tomb, or are you living knowing he's been resurrected? Is your life a life of fear, or is it a life of faith? Is it a, a life of hope, or is it a life of despair? Where are you living, and how are you living? Jesus can make all things new. So if you're here today and say, I've not been living that resurrected life, but I I want to commit to that life today. I want to follow Jesus. That's what it takes. You've got to say, Jesus, I want you as my Lord and Savior. What we find in Scripture says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That's what it looks like. And then you start to journey with Jesus for a lifetime. And it starts from now all the way through eternity. So with every head bowed in this room, I want to give you an opportunity to say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to start living in that resurrected life. And I just want to pray with you before we leave today. Anybody here today that would say, I want to follow Jesus. I want to live in that resurrected life. I want to commit my life to him. Up in the balcony, anybody else that would say, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to commit my life to him. I want him to be my Lord and Savior so that I can step into that life that we're offered in him. Jesus, we just thank you for each and every one in this room. We thank you for these lives that are committing themselves to you to live the resurrected life that, that were promised. And so God, I pray for those that raised their hand and maybe those that, that didn't but have a heart to say yes to you today. I pray, Jesus, that as we sing, they would truly commit their lives to you today. They wouldn't hold anything back from you but they would be filled with the hope that only you can give. They would be filled with the peace that only you can provide and be confident in you, not only today, but tomorrow and the rest of their lives. So Jesus, we commit all things to you, believing that you're at work in the hearts of everyone in this room. May we live knowing you've been resurrected. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.